say you have to write reboot or do something stupid um but you fiddle around with the uh, the knobs adam and uh, you managed to make it work so um yep yes yeah, so that's quite impressive that's quite impressive um anyway uh, we are live everybody um so welcome everybody to brain food live on air it's episode 112 can you believe it, adam 112 we've done these uh, that's incredible which- you you've done about 80 of them at least um uh, yeah right up there uh, um that's actually a hell of a run if you think about every week so we've done this like for over two years probably coming up to two and a half years but we haven't been like 100 percent every week but that is a pretty good achievement so thank you everybody firstly for uh being with us all this time um it's been a pleasure um it's really been a pleasure sort of doing it um I, I think i speak for adam and myself and saying you know this doesn't feel like work for us it feels like a very good way for us to spend uh, just an hour of time and having conversations with the community on topics of interest so yeah i'm um, awesome that we're there um okay uh quick sound check everybody because we are multicasting as usual we should be broadcasting this to linkedin so if you're on linkedin and you can hear me okay please let me know there's a lot of good emoticons you can kind of you kind of do a, an up or down thumb you kind of do oh i'm curious or that's very you can do a light bulb and all those kind of things let me know whether you can hear me okay just give me a yes or no on the linkedin that'd be useful um i think you can hear me okay on crowdcast so if you can please say uh please say so uh be good to know whether the sound is okay um and we're on uh, facebook as well in the facebook group is anybody still watching on facebook i've been noticing the view count go down on facebook maybe we're abandoning that scene um so if you are on there uh, let me know Oh, um, and in fact, if you want me to switch it to another channel, um, that's something also I need to think about. I might move it to Discord, actually, Adam. What do you think of that? Yeah, bit, I think that's a good idea, yeah. Bit cool, right? Um, Discord, I, right? I, I've noticed people kind of like have a real aversion to Facebook, and I've been like a big campaigner for Zuckerberg because I think he's been really hard. Dubai, um, uh, but I believe that's like one of my opinions that isn't gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna carry the day with that opinion. Um, so, so there we go. Anyway, uh, we seem to be okay at least on two of those channels, which is okay. Um, so we're gonna carry on as we should. A quick word to our sponsors. Thank you very much to E6. This is our second time they're sponsoring us uh, on Brain Food Live. They are the Executive Search Information Exchange, and um, I would say. Uh, the number one organization for leadership and exec search practitioners. So if you are a person that is working and recruiting at the C level um, and you're not part of this industry, this this network, you kind of should be um, because they have run a fantastic kind of invite only uh, community um, where you're really talking about the top people in your space globally uh, sharing insights. So do check out esix esix.org. Um, okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, um, Adam, good to see you, mate. Um, uh, I hope I'm not intruding on Euro 2021. By the way, what is when is it kick, kicking off uh, today? When's what kicking off? The footy. It's on today, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's Italy and Turkey this evening. That's the first game. So my um, my time zoning is all over the place. It's like eight o'clock yeah, already. Sure. Nine o'clock, seven o'clock here already in Hong Kong, and I'm thinking. Is the game going to happen in an hour or so? And it's like no, nah, it's lunchtime. It's not till it's eight eight p.m. UK time, nine p.m. in Europe, in Central Europe. So uh, yeah, can't, I really can't wait. I've never thought I'd say that, but I cannot wait to watch it. I just love international football. I love it more than club football, just because. Yeah, it's, it's, I just do. I just do, and I do, I do as well. It's rarer, and it's um, it, it's just the, the 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 sensation of the everyone getting into it is just much more. Like you get casuals and like proper fans in and everything. So anyway, what do you reckon, Turkey to Italy today? What you, what's the score? Well, I asked my wife actually this morning, who who doesn't know anything. In fact, I didn't really. She just gave her opinion. She knows absolutely nothing about football, but she said, "Yeah, Italy's clearly going to win that." Right. So. I'd expect, yeah, she's right. Italy are going to win that. 2-0 two nil, two nil, uh, two nil to uh, Italy. Um, as, as Lee said, Scotland's cup final next Friday. That's not really the cup final. The cup final is going to be four days later on the 22nd against Croatia. Because if we beat the Czech Republic um, on Monday, which we could, we beat them twice last year, and then even just get only like a one or two goal difference against England, then it's a it's a it's the World Cup final is us against Croatia to uh, get through. 
Yeah, it's exciting. Good to see Scotland there. Great to see Wales there as well. And England, of, of course. I, by the way, am predicting Italy to win the entire thing. But I think they'll lose today. They'll lose the opener against Turkey uh, and then that will galvanize them to go on to win it um, I reckon they will be like oh my goodness we have to radically surgically change this team um, and then they'll go on so anyway let me know in comments which is your favorite team and how, how are you gonna do you know how are you gonna do in Euro 2020 anyway let's get on with the show we're talking about a topic that was close to your heart I would actually be very interested in your view on this Adam because I know you talked about it um, well, actually we should really review the newsletter shouldn't we um, very quickly very quickly in this case, as time is short. Give us two yeah. things that was interesting from the news there last week. Um, okay, the first one is um, I enjoyed Culture Amp's employee engagement survey questions. It's basically this is how you do an employee engagement survey. You just go and copy it. That's you know they're the leaders in this space. Yep. Employee engagement, for those that don't know, is um, really the, the way that you measure um, people's motivation and enthusiasm for working at your organization. Um, some companies care a lot about it, and some companies, like actively, don't care about it. That's just part of their model. Yeah. Um, but I was interested to know that they also included in there the five drivers of employee engagement, and they were number one, the most important one is how is this company going to help me develop myself? So it was learning and development. The second one was leadership. How much do I believe in the leadership in this organization? The third one was how focused is this organization on service and quality? And I was really interested in that because, again, some companies actively don't care about that. Um, it's, it's, it's their model, whereas others, you know, it's the number one thing. So I was interested that was number three. The third one's about feeling valued, and the fourth one's about company vision. I'm surprised that company purpose is not up there in those top five, but um, I imagine it, it, will be, it will be shooting up the you know, table of different factors that people are considering as they have got more opportunity to work for different organizations than they have had ever before. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was a really interesting post. Not, not only interesting, but Adam was right. It's like, don't overthink it, just copy and paste this. It's like, if you, if you don't have anything else, just start with this and you're gonna be okay. Uh, obviously, it'll then evolve into your, your own usage, but it, they are the leaders in this as far as um, uh, sort of their research is concerned. And because they've got that point where they've got like so many customers, they've probably got a lot of information that they can feed back into their product and their, how they construct um, their frameworks. So it might be a case that they get better as they get bigger. Uh, anyway, I've shared it in the chat stream in uh, Crowdcast, so check it out. Um, it's like just free to use template. No reason why not. Uh, okay, one more, mate. Well, um... I mean, there's a, there's a few. It was a great newsletter as, no, as normal. Um, but I want to talk about the Twitter thread. There's a guy who writes about the finance of sport. And his um, he, he, he posted a Twitter thread about Matthew Benham, who is the owner of Brentford Football Club. For those of you that um, don't know much about football or don't know much about the UK football scene, Brentford was, when I was a kid, when Hung was a kid, Brentford was like pretty much a non-league team, I think. Um, anyway, he took them over, um, and um, it's all about how did he use analytics, how did he play a completely different game and take practices that were the opposite of what other people were doing to turn that into a tiny little football team, into what is about to become an English Premier League football team. The English Premier League is the biggest league in the world. Um, by far the most prestigious and like amount of money in it and all that kind of thing. And um, he's managed to do that in a pretty comparatively short period of time. The the link to HR and recruitment here is there's a lot of different aspects to it. Um, but the one that I particularly found interesting was while other organizations were putting millions into their academies, their academies are their like, you know, kids training like, uh, like let's, let's go and scout the local schools and stuff, bring in the very best kids. Let's like work with them, invest in them, and we'll create the team of the future and we'll probably sell some of them and you know, it'll, it'll pay for itself. He binned it. He just binned it entirely. He said, we're not doing that. Everybody else is creating a team that they do not want anymore that's good enough for us to go up the leagues. So they relied on everybody else's you know, failures, really, academy really failures. Clever. 
really I have, a, I, have a thing, I have a thing about this i mean what they did um was basically say you know what we're not we're, everyone else is spending way too much money and they tracked how many youth players made it in the teams that they were initially sort of recruited in and they found that actually a lot of them didn't make it just by statistical average they don't make it um and they just realized brentford realized that you know what you can't really tell the performance of a person um unless you play them for 35 games in a season so in other words you've got to commit to that period of time so that the person can really get into the team lose the nerves get into the flow states do all of those things and those kids never had the chance in the clubs that kind of developed them and they simply yeah. got released um and uh, what brentford did was say okay we're not going to do what the other clubs are doing we're just going to hoover up talent that was prematurely discarded think about that look at all the graduate schemes that are coming in people that don't make it for whatever reason they go off you know disappear off into different things can you harvest that talent instead of thinking about trying to compete with mckinsey's and stuff you know um uh, because you're going to lose out to a bigger brand at, at the end of the day but they're not they're not necessarily recruiting the best people they just like processing uh, a bunch of people like everyone else so anyway um what they managed to do is and they've got track record of, with, with this is simply pick up players at very very cheap rates and then in the english game uh, in european game generally global game uh, you can transfer players for transfer fees and they've just turned around people for lots of money ollie watkins came from Bradford before we went to uh, aston Villa, sold for 25 million quid or something so and he put the pick them up for nothing so anyway really really interesting case study i think it's worth uh, the lesson there for us in recruiting is to figure out look um some of the kpi the dogmatic and kpi we kind of think are definitely true or how we recruit and understand what is good we have to challenge some of that because if everybody in the industry agrees that these are the measures if you're using the same measures there's no way you can gain competitive advantage because you're just doing what everyone else is doing um so just a slight shift of the focus then maybe that will give you the chance anyway i, super I, got, a interesting. Of, I, I got a bit of first-hand insight into this in the background of it because um a guy i know is uh neil McElhargy was a uh, basically a player analyst there um at brentford and he really? the reason i met him was because he moved to yeah he moved to uh he moved to glasgow with mark warburton when warburton left brentford to come to rangers and um he's now at manchester united neil but um it's like i mean they the anal the analysis they do around exactly how far do people run in each game you know exactly how many times do they jump exactly how many times do they kick the ball you know all that sort of stuff it was like intense but the guy matthew benham start he went to oxford university he worked at credit suisse became some sort of vp of something so he was a banker 12 years moved into sports gambling and then just became a gambler, a sports gambler, made a load of money, 700,000 loan into Brentford on the basis that if they didn't pay it back, he got ownership of the club. It's now worth 300 million. That's another thing that's worth thinking about. Gambling is one of those uh, entertainments that is denigrated, but the ability to calculate risk is not to be underestimated, particularly in business. Um, and in fact, today's topic of the conversation is a great deal about calculating risk, particularly the responsibilities that business owners have in doing that. Um, uh, because we're in a situation now where um, uh, we, we've got uh, kind of what I call a hybrid consensus. So we've, we've kind of got to a point where we seem to have all agreed um, that, yeah, we're going to move to some sort of state uh, where the future state of work is going to be a mix of people working from home or uh, working in office, and it's going to be a hybrid model. But there's two things here that, which I thought was interesting is, number one, we, ca we kind of seem to have got to this point without a huge amount of debate. Um, uh, you know, we've simply just seemingly agreed that this is how we're going to do it. And I think, okay, maybe it's worth us talking about a little bit more. So, you know, I've started to make some noise about this. Um, and secondly, I think there's some clear challenges to this um uh, particularly when you're thinking about the wider business perspective now as an employee as a person that loves flexibility you know i'm i'm uh, i work remotely distributed i have done for a long time i'll never get back into an office that's for sure so i, I totally understand that side of things but if i was a business owner and i had responsibilities for keeping the business surviving and competitive and profitable and doing all of those things you need to do to keep that thing going to win a tough market um you need to make the decisions um that often aren't 
um, uh, 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 precisely aligned with every single individual employee's ideal desires. Um, and I want to explore that tension today. So that's the topic of the conversation, problems with hybrid and have employees, have we given employee expectation? Is it too high now? Um, and do we need to talk to business leaders and understand Understand what their thoughts are. There's a lot of demonization of CEOs as well. I'm a bit kind of concerned about this. Um, where, yes, some people deserve it. I get it. But most most leaders of business have found themselves in a position of leadership, um, and they have to make the best decision for the entire group. Um, and if your business goes bust because you're not you, you're not uh, able or have the courage to make those decisions, then everyone else is going to lose their jobs, and you're not going to do anybody any favors there. So. Let's talk about this. Um, okay, before we bring our guests on, let's quickly with you, Adam. Where are you with this idea of remote hybrid and what have you? You're running a, what, 20-man business or so, 20-person business. Where do you sit with this? Have you gone on a journey on it? How, what's, your, what's your current uh, state of, uh, of thought on it? Well, look, I, <clears throat> I've done a lot of study on neuro-linguistic programming, and one of the things that I learned from that is the more flexible the options you give people, the more likely they are to take that next step with you, whatever that is. And I'll, I'll put that into the context of talent attraction. You're giving people the opportunity to come and work at your company. They've, they've got to apply. You give them an application form as an option. You ask for a CV as an option. They can send in a video as an option, or they can turn up for your recruitment open day as a fourth option. More people are going to apply for the job if you give them four options rather than the you tell them, here's one way to do it. So. Taking that concept into the subject we're talking about today, if you give people different options for how they can work for your company, more people are going to want to work for your company. So my view is that every smart employer needs to um, give every option that there is available within reason. Um, I'm really going to be interested in Neil's uh, perspective on this because recruitment agencies, a lot of them, are not taking that view at all. Yeah, well, I mean, we're, there's there's loads of people. I think Neil's got a um a, an angle from a couple of uh, sort of he's also CEO yeah. of a business as well. So uh, and then also looking at the the wider um marketplace. Um, so this would be super interesting. So Steve, thank you for your comments there. I think you're probably in alignment with everyone else. Um, uh, are the expectations of management too high or too low? Um, let's see. Let's see if we can bring some of our guests on here. Um, I'm gonna bring on uh. Okay, let's go with Neil Morrison. I can see him right there. Um, let's see whether we can get Alex in as well. I did see her just now, but she's disappeared on us. Oh, here she is. Boom. Let's do that. Cool. Yeah. So hopefully we're going to get Neil Morrison on. Um, they're going to introduce themselves shortly. Um, and Alex, the pledge should be there as well. Like, I totally get what people are saying. Hybrid is all good, but... At some point, the more hybrid you get, the more overhead that you, you put onto the rest of the business in a different way. Um, and there's going to be a tension there. Um, so, yes, you want to give people flexibility. I totally get that. Um, but there may be a point where um, suddenly you, you're uh, operating at a, at a kind of – you're almost maxing out because you have to do so many different ways to co communicate where in the in previous instance there was only one situation where you communicated. So I think there's tension there. But let's explore it. Okay, let's uh, say hi to our friends here. Uh, let's go with you first, Neil. Uh, Neil, uh, uh, firstly, uh, nice to see you. And secondly, uh, who are you and what is it you do, Neil? Hello. Yeah, so uh, my name is Neil Morrison. I'm the uh, director of HR for 7 Trent, which is a FTSE 100 um, utility business. Fantastic stuff. Great to have you on the show, Neil. Um, it's been a while since you've been on, so fantastic to see you. Um, and there's um, there's Alex the Pledge. Great to see you, Alex. Been a little while, um, and wonderful to see you. Um, can you quickly introduce yourself and the few people who might not know who you are? Um, it will be uh, good to, uh, uh, to connect those dots. Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, I'm smiling away here because my, my first job was at United Utilities, so um, I know the water industry very well. And now I work in architecture, absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, but my name's Alex Pledge, and um, I am, um, I guess, a serial entrepreneur. I built a business, sold it in 2015 called Hassle.com, and I'm on my second business now, which is Resi, which is the UK's um, largest um, architectural platform. Um, we cover the whole of the UK, and I've got about 120 people, I think, something like that, um, in Brixton. That's fantastic. And Alex, you're not going to mention 
Right, but uh, she, uh, Alex is also a member of the British Empire um, uh, for her sterling work for entrepreneurship in the UK. So fantastic. This may be a debut for us in Brain Food Live, but um, awesome job, obviously, with Hassel. That was one of the, the, the big, great success stories, I think, in UK startup last, last couple of years. And fantastic to see you come back. Uh, with another cool business. Okay, let's launch into this topic because it is very testy and I don't want to like pour fire onto the wound, but the reason why I want to talk about it and bring you to one is because we're hearing a lot about, you know, yes, employee expectations um, uh, or flexibility is something we want, um, but there's a tension between what the bosses are saying, it seems, and what the uh, what the employees want. Uh, can you just explain this tension? What do you think about this? Um, and uh, what's your position as a business leader? Let's go with you first on this, Neil. Yeah, so, so um, first thing I want to say is I've got nothing against hybrid working. I just don't think we've thought through the problem that we're trying to solve at the moment. And, and so we've just landed in a position um, and what you're starting to see is, as you were talking about earlier, this kind of, you know, this co consensus in the media of everyone saying, oh, it's hybrid, you know, the future of work is hybrid. It was human a couple of years ago, but we've switched that now. Um, and everyone's saying that's what we're going to do. Um, but we haven't thought through the consequences. And I think the importance of business leaders is helping to think through the broader kind of socioeconomic consequences of changes in work. Um, and that's the bit that I, I, I think at the moment is massively, massively missing. So we're looking at it at an employee level. So I want choice, that's brilliant, that's amazing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or an organizational level of, you know, what does that mean in terms of productivity? But nobody's saying, what does this mean in terms of housing, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of jobs, in terms of the economy? What does it mean in terms of diversity and inclusion? We're, we're just not thinking it through. Uh, and, you know, if you think that only 60% of the workforce, sorry, only 40% of the workforce can work from home, 60% of the workforce don't work from home, and those that can work from home are disproportionately socio from so, uh, higher socioeconomic groups, they're disproportionately male, they're disproportionately white, they disproportionately live in the south of the UK, then you're fixing a problem for a very, very privileged group of people. And that's not the way that I think we should run the country or, or business. Wow. Trust Neil Morrison to just like elevate the uh, conversation right the way <laughs> to, at, at the state and society level. But quite right, Neil. I think a lot of the people obviously evangelizing for remote and distributed, which by the way, I am, um, uh, we, we generally live quite privileged lives, don't we? Like we're, we're not the people that are, are, do jobs that actually require physical presence. Um, and there's an unequal distribution also, as you mentioned, as to where these jobs are. They're in metropolitan centers, the digital working, knowledge working. In the Northeast where, Alex, I think you're from the North somewhere, aren't you? Um, uh, so in the Northeast where I'm from, I think the work from home percentage is like literally in single figures. Um, you know, the, the numbers of people that actually work from home and go into the office is, is basically government workers. Um, and there's nobody else really doing that. So you, you're looking at a geographical distribution of who works from home and who doesn't. And it's going to look kind of, as you say, Neil, we don't know what the consequences are. Maybe that's going to be OK. But have we thought it through? It, it, I'm interested exactly. to know what the yeah what the chat what the what the what the problem that 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 creates is because I can see I totally agree as well with what you just said. Um, what's the problem that that creates? Because it, it may be that it doesn't do anything that that's not already happening, or it may be that it, it uh, magnifies a divide. So, so okay, can can I give two answers to that? Really, really yeah, briefly. Ahead, let quick, me give yeah. let me give you a quick housing answer. So uh, everyone comes out of London on London-based salaries and goes and lives on the south coast. The nurses, the teachers, the people who run essential services living in those areas can't afford housing because the housing market increases. So there's a problem. The other one is if you give choice, we know that disproportionately women tend to be the carers uh, still in society. And therefore, there's greater societal pressure on them to be seen, to be at home, to, to be able to manage their work around those responsibilities. And if you've got a predominantly male workforce in the, let's say in the offices and females working at home, I'm not saying that's gonna happen, but it could happen. And then decisions are being made, you end up with further 
discrimination in the workplace. So it, I'm not saying it could, will happen, but it could. And we just and need say, to think it through. And you're saying you need to think it through. I think that's fair. So, so, so before people come down and jump on Neil's uh, <laughs> sort of Twitter, um, I just want to, 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 to be clear. Neil is saying these are things that might happen and we need to just be aware of them. And obviously we're not talking about them because I hadn't even thought about these these issues. Is there potentially going to be a gender, like an exacerbated gender divide if we go with this optimal choice scenario? Some evidence, by the way, that that might happen. Um, you simply have to look at the Dutch market, for instance, um, where by law, um, every uh, job needs to be provided for with a reduced hours option. Um, so the individual who accepts the job has the choice to whether do the full time or to do the reduced hours in order to create extra flexibility. That's all well and good. We all automatically think that's great. But there is an outcome to that, which the Dutch didn't expect, um, which is linked to your point, Neil, which is the division of childcare is obviously still more towards the women than it is towards the men, even in a super equal place like the Netherlands. And predominantly, the women are the ones that are choosing reduced hours. That has a downstream effect on the numbers of senior managers in Dutch companies that are women, which is significantly lower than the European average. Completely the opposite of what the initial law or the initial rule was. So it's an example of what, wow, we've got to be careful in thinking about all of these things before we rush to saying this is the panacea. Okay, um, Alex, I'm going to go to you with this one in terms of gentrification. <laughs> I mean, they mentioned it, but I didn't even think about that. But yes, if you're going to push out software developers earning 150 grand in, in, in London and he or she decides, you know what, I rather fancy Cornwall or whatever it is, uh, you know, a nice place that isn't particularly expensive, suddenly that those rents go up. Aren't we already seeing, in fact, in these coastal cities and resort cities that the rents are going up and the prices, the house price rises are, are rising all, the, all, all those places? local people who work in those places are going to be gentrified out, which you know, I understood was a problem at some point. Thoughts on this, Alex? Um, so I'm glad Neil went first because he articulated the argument that I would have made. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit more succinct and probably more antagonistic about this. This is absolutely a middle class arrogance about this and it infuriates me. So if you look, you only have to look at recent house prices, they're going up not in London, they're going up in, in the belt of London. So people who were happy to commute an hour into London are now moving out two hours. People who are in London are moving out an hour. And we've reflected this in Resus data. All of the work that we've been doing, predominantly pre-lockdown, was um, within the M25 band. That was our biggest market at Resi. Our biggest market now is shifting, so it's outside, because people are moving and then they're, they're building, which is which is normal. When you buy a house, is, is usually six months afterwards is when you see the most amount of work taking place on it. So I don't necessarily think we need to look too far to see this already happening. Um, and I think the other thing that um, I think is inequitable about this is there are certain jobs that are very well set up for doing remote work, software engineering, writing, journalists, things that are things that you can do on a desktop. Now, there are other things that need um, a, a serious a more amount of collaboration. So in my company, Architecture, um, we did brilliantly well. Like we were not remote working at all. We had flexible working policies, which is, I think, what we're actually talking about rather than hybrid work. But we didn't have a hard and fast rule about it because we did it on a case by case basis according to people's needs, which is how I feel a lot of this stuff should be done. But as with everything, we love to legislate in the UK. So now we're going to try and legislate this through social media and popular demand rather than through thinking it through and so what we ha actually found is once we went remote overnight we managed to hold it together our architects went remote we drove around london with vans of tables and desks and things to, to pass it out and we made that switch and we also made a software switch so we took the entire 60 architects and put them onto a new software platform which is incredibly hard and so i learned a couple of things one architects need to collaborate so we were 30 percent less productive when we were at home so that's in the data it, it, you know it's not a we couldn't do it we did it before you go go on that's a really interesting stat you're saying there's data to prove a reduction of productivity in this type of job can you tell us how what that data is i mean what was the output that that allows you to make that claim uh, alex well, we, we look at the number of hours that we are uh, we are client facing. So the number of productive hours that we work that we get paid for a bit like lawyers do, but we're maybe not we're not like clicking a button. And um, 
and and that and that just went down because you're not when you're an architect you have a drafter you have your technician you have your planning consultants and what you're talking about is this person's house they want to do x y and z what can actually be done what will get through planning what will get through planning how is that going to be built into a model so like what materials you're going to use and that is you, you can do that remotely you absolutely can have a zoom call but it's, it's those little like oh what would you do here so there was that first of all there was that but the second thing we also learned is it's incredibly hard to train people over zoom does digital learning work yes it does, but not exclusively and so we what was really what i found out as well because most of my as it won't surprise you architects are introverted is they were sitting in their bedrooms googling um or like looking on youtube of how to do certain things in this new software rather than reaching out to their line manager or the trainers that we provided and so it's really hard when you can't walk around and see someone struggling so i'm not making the case for a full return to the office i think flexible working absolutely should be as um, adam said at the start of the call the more options you can provide the better but this whole idea now that i mean we can't hire engineers because they want to be fully remote and, and that's the inequity for me is that some jobs can be done remotely and work really well and then others need to be in the office but because people are people regardless of what they do you can't suddenly say well my engineering team is going to be fully remote but the rest of you well sorry mate you've all got to get in the office because it don't work that way and you can't please everybody and so it puts business leaders in an incredibly difficult position because whatever i do i am damned like whatever I do, if I go fully remote, some people won't be happy. If I'm all in the office, some people won't be happy. So you end up in this like no man's land of hybrid. And so we've actually legislated Monday, Tuesday, Thursday in the office, Wednesday, Friday at home. And the way we've done that is by talking about the type of work you do on each day. So you've basically had to... Go ahead. I was just going to say, I was gonna say can I just propose a, a, a slightly <clears throat> um, different look at this, which is, because I, I agree with everything that you've all said here, but slightly different look at this we talked about the neil talked about the economic um you know um challenges that that this creates and the difference between let's just say middle class jobs can work from home and working class jobs pretty much can't for example i mean if we look at it like that and hung what you just said about the northeast the, the status quo until now has been that i'm going to exaggerate here but 90 percent of the best jobs or best high high paid jobs are within the M25 or in, they're in the southeast of England. So does this give people in the northeast, you know, a culture shift like this, does it give them a lot more chance to work for Alex's company, for example, um, and earn a much higher salary than maybe they are in whatever they're doing for Northumbria Council today? You know, there's, there's a couple of other slightly counter arguments to this as well. Right, so that's a good argument, Adam. I want to pick it up real quick. That's what Stephen Rothberg said. Um, so the idea is, look, that's true. There is a geographical dis discrepancy at the moment, um, but it, that's a, as a result not of the shift to remote or to hybrid. That's a, as a shift to this urban agglomeration that we've had over the last several decades. So maybe what remote will help us do is to help people not have to move to the big cities. And over time, um, those areas are actually going to naturally go back upwards. I'll also add to that, Adam, in the sense that the gentrification argument may also be used as a positive in, in a certain certain sense, because you might be able to argue it's a redistribution of wealth um, from the cities back to these regions. Um, but again, deeper things. Um, go on, Adam, you about to say something else then? No, oh, just, it? Just, okay. it's a, just, just it's an interesting, there's, there's so many different elements to this. That all there the is. is it is it's, it's definitely worth uh, discussing uh, alex i want to jump on the thing that you said at the end which is you feel as a ceo of a business with responsibilities you know you've got investors you've got customers you've got staff you've got all of these things to think about but you're currently feeling that you don't there's no good options it's like just bad options you're going to take and it's you're going to get damned if you do or you don't um uh, like how, how did you what is your the guiding philosophy to get through that situation i mean how did you come to this situation where you thought right we're going to chop it up into a fixed time so i think people now call it hybrid synchronicity or something where you're saying you know what it's not you can choose whatever you want but we're going to fix the days when you're going to be in office and then there's going to be fixed days when you're out of office how do you settle on that as a progressive step from you know the free-for-all 
so we always had work from uh, we always had no meetings on a wednesday that was like a, we tried to give everyone you know that deep work that they wanted and i don't like i didn't want to do mondays and fridays because they're the most popular taken days off right so you it, may, it might make sense to do tuesday and thursday but uh, you know for the sake of the people who are traveling up and down yeah, look, I'll be really, really honest with you. I like, I hate my job right now. Like, I've hated it for a good 18 months. I find it really hard to keep the company going, like, in, in the face of everything that's going on. And, and this is a company, by the way, that's grown in the pandemic. It's not a company that wasn't um, okay. Um, and the reason I hate my job is I feel like the pendulum has swung from everything being about the company all the way across to it all being about the employee and I, i'm really excited for the time when we move back to the middle ground and it is a give and take exercise i feel and so because i'm damned if i do and i'm damned if i don't and i don't really enjoy it what have i got to lose at this point right I, i've got to do what's best for the company rather than what's best for the employees or individuals and the employees because you always get those noisy factions so what i decided is i sat down and i worked out what i thought we needed as a company not as a set of individuals and, and that I could make the three days a week work because we could be productive, we could collaborate, we could meet and do all of the kind of, you know, the, the stuff that can't happen in asynchronously. And then also give people that time that they wanted at home. Because I, listen, I'm a working mum, I have a three year old and a six year old, like, and I'm privileged because I've, you know, I've got a nanny. I'm not, not saying I'm not, but I also do the lion's share of, of, of the childcare and my husband doesn't. So I absolutely sympathize with a lot of the women who um, struggled during the pandemic. And in fact, actually, Economist did a great article on uh, Mumsnet attract the number of fucks on the website, and it went through the roof every time Boris cl closed the schools. Um, so for me, there's a larger thing around childcare needs to be an infrastructure issue, right? If we're talking about transport, we're talking about housing, we're talking about utilities, childcare. It's fundamentally an infrastructure issue. Anyway, I digress. So the reason that I went for the three days was because I don't think it works when you say to someone, choose what three days, because then you can't guarantee who's in the office and that and the reason for the office dissipates. And so and also I, I, Zoom don't work. Either you're all on Zoom or none of you are on Zoom. It just it, 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 you know, you end up with that quality. To Adam's point, this whole well, maybe someone in Newcastle can work for Resi. Um that person in Newcastle is going to be a disadvantage if they work for Resi because there's going to be those people in the office and this is why I don't think it works so I was trying to get rid of that that you know that barrier between those people at home and those people in the office um, and so we just I just went for it and we've, we're running an eight-week experiment we've we've been back in the office um three days a week since was it May whatever the last watershed was that before the June one and we said well, it's the end of July and then I give everybody a chance to feedback and we've got from there but overwhelmingly you know what my guys wanted to come back to the office they were tired of being in their one rooms in London um and you know uh, it's going okay so far but that's a that's a really interesting thing so you said they're, they're tired of being in their one rooms in London and I mean I think we were talking earlier about this you know the concept of work from home benefits people in London I've got a much smaller company than, than you do, Alex. I've got 20 people, but I, I surveyed them about two months into the pandemic and I surveyed them in January and said, who wants to, when we're allowed to work in the office again, who wants to work in the office, who wants to work from home and who wants an everyday choice? And at the beginning, there was like two people said they wanted to work in the office. Everybody else said they want an everyday choice. And when I just surveyed them, them again there, they, they all said they wanted an everyday choice, but most of them have told me personally that they're really enjoying working from home. But the price of property in Glasgow is massively cheaper than it is in London. So you've got more than one room here. So, you know, I'm not sure it entirely, just another kind of point is, I'm not sure it entirely benefits people just in the southeast. I can have a much bigger house in Newcastle than I can in Brixton. You know what, I, I, it would be good to do a regional analysis on it to see what appetite is, because you make a very good point. There's certain places that where, where the home environment is actually the worst place to be. This, you take it to a global level. I mean, Neil, I'm going to trump you with your national focus, mate. You go to the global level um, and East Asia, no money's interested in working from home um because you've got very small space you literally got the smallest space per foot per per, per per dollar that you can spend the office is the space where you need to be 
So they're going to go back to the office. There's no doubt about that. Um, whereas if you have like lots of space at home, you've got a spare desk, you've got a studio, you've got things you can do, then maybe that becomes more of a viable state. So I'd love to see some data on where that is. Um, okay, um, let's uh, explain explore this uh, idea just a little bit further about this fixed um, concept. Um, it's true, I'm still confined in that one room, which I, I'm actually That's okay with. That's why I was with. smiling at that, uh, by the way. I wasn't, I wasn't smiling actually, at I'm the market a, space. I'm what actually okay with, because I've realized I'm just a sloth, um, and I don't, I don't really need to move. Uh, my, my territorial range is about, you know, possibly about three meters. I don't have a problem so, with that. Sorry, um, Paul, can, can, I, can I say one really quick point? I think Adam raises a really good point about companies. But if we're going to look at this, you have to look at this as, as, as the size of company. So a lot of the big companies are fine because they've already got the infrastructure and processes and communication channels to maintain this vast, you know, distributed net network because they've got, they're already in it. And people sub 20, it's easy to wrap your hands around that company, and make sure the communication don't break down. It's that 20 to 200, which is actually probably not even that many businesses that really really struggle or the ones that are growing really rapidly so again it's not just a one size fits all on the companies either that's a really good think a bit of thinking as well like the um the size or maturation of the company might be a, a fact that we haven't talked about again folks we're not sort of advocating for one position or the other we're just saying we haven't talked about it enough but already we're, some of these ideas are emerging is remote super su suitable for you because you're running a small business and you kind of all know each other anyway and it's obviously the trust factors are already there it's totally fine or whether you're working for a mega business that has like multi-office therefore probably multicultural type of um, experience in any case then maybe you can have multiple options but if you're a i would even say a single office 500 person sort of in the same building type of thing that's where probably the biggest challenges are um uh, if you've all walked before into the same building and now you're kind of not in the same space not in the same time then i think they, they, they could be uh, challenges um anyway um okay listen we're, we're, we're kind of moving on real quick so i want to bring on um neil uh carberry and dims uh and nims the one in, in a sec but before we let neil and alex go i just wanted to leave you uh, with a, uh, basically a final thing that you, you've got to say on this topic. Um, where do you think we should, what should we talk about? And where should, how do we make these decisions to make it better? Um, uh, you first, Neil, what would you like to see, I guess, in this debate um, uh, before uh, yeah, anything else goes forward? Um, so I think if I was going to say one thing, I think it, it, it's, we just need to take a bit more time, be a bit more thoughtful, look at the macro uh, economic the the socio-economic implications of this and not look at work in isolation because it doesn't exist in isolation it's part of our, and the fabric of our society and therefore we've just got to be really really careful that we don't rush into it and what i would say hung in, in terms of your point about analysis of cities that's been done the center for cities did the analysis and if you look at those areas that can work from home they're predominantly in the south uh, in high percentages. So I've shared that on an article that I put in, but I'll try and put it in the chat as well. Please, please do. That'll be very, very interesting. Um, okay. How about you, Alex? Uh, what's the thing that you've got to say maybe to other CEOs or other business leaders that are wrestling with the same kind of situation that you've wrestled with? Um, sorry, I have a school outside, so I realize I'm a bit noisy. I apologize. At least the kids haven't come in, so we're winning. Um, I would say I, I'm actually hugely pissed off with the business community and have been throughout the whole COVID period. We don't have a voice. We're not coherent. We, we won't venture an opinion anymore. I don't know if Brexit kneecapped us or what went on, but I think we have a social responsibility and a moral obligation to have this debate as a business community and stop trying to one up each other in the press. Um, whether it's, you know, Goldman Sachs, get back in the office or um, oh, it was the other one that was like, oh, ah, we're never coming back to the office. It's not helping Credit the debate Suisse. at all. Credit, thank you. It is not helping the debate and we're not actually having a debate. We're standing on ceremony. And I just think that um, I'm just, I'm just, I don't know what's happened. I, I don't know where they've gone, but it's, it feels like Brexit's kneecapped us and we need some business leaders to find their voice again because they don't listen to people like me. I'm only small fry out there but um i think some we need to start having that conversation more openly and stop being so afraid of our employees we're really afraid but after black lives matter and me too and god knows what other movements we've had not that those movements weren't good but sometimes we lose 
the, 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 the gem of what that was about and we make it into something else and that it becomes corrosive and destructive and and i think it's it's cowed a lot of business leaders um yeah and i, and I for one won't be cowed because i think we need to do the right thing by everybody and that means to have a good debate and, and, we, and we can see that uh very well thank you very much alex for saying it um it is probably a topic for another brain food live actually what's the relationship uh with the ceo activism and employee activism um and how does that apply to business because we've seen a lot of stories about this where people ceos have come out and said listen we have to run this as a politics zone and then there's a massive dog pile online you know they're literally hammering them because obviously they should be taking a political position on it and then you stop and think yeah, like is, is it the business's responsibility to do that um because that's not what it was set up for. Um, like who owns that responsibility? Um, so a topic that again, we need to discuss, but not for today, because we've got to move on. Uh, anyway, Alex, um, let me let you go. Thank you so much for your time. Great to see you. We'll invite you back if you're up for it. Um, Neil, great to see you, sir. Um, have a good day. And yeah, we'll definitely get you back also at some other point. You've made some brilliant points, you too. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, one thing I can say with those two, they're two very, very smart people, and, and they are certainly business leaders. I mean, because what a, a leader is, a person who is able and prepared to say things that are not easy to, to hear. Um, and the final point that Alex mentioned, I think, was a very powerful point, which is, you know, sometimes you've got to, you've got to, you've got to say the things that hurt a little bit, um, because, it, you know, you're, you're running, the, you're running the business. It's your job to make the best decision for that business um and sometimes that's not good you're gonna have to break some eggs to, to, to break some sh eggs to make a, an omelet i guess anyway let's move swiftly I, on i i I, abs <clears throat> I absolutely love that um i really did we don't have neil made loads of great points very um intelligent points alex made loads of great intelligent points as well we we almost never have anybody coming on talking the way that alex just talked to us no. Um, and it's really refreshing to hear somebody, you know, a, an entrepreneur who's just so honest about, um, oh, a lot of things. She's hated it. She's hated the last 18 months. Wow. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I can, underst I can understand why. It's, it's probably the opposite experience to mine, but, I, I, you know, everybody has had completely different, uh, you know, a completely different experience over the last uh, 18 months. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's not easy. Um. Anyway, we've got another pair of guests on, so let's introduce them real quick. Um. Let's go with you first, Nims. Uh, Nims, can you introduce yourself? Uh, who are you and what it is you do? Hi, everybody. I'm Nims. I am an organisational design and development consultant, and I work in the Ministry of Defence. Fantastic. Great to see you back, Nims. Um. And uh, Neil, good to see you, sir. Also, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who you are? What it is you do? Hi, 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 afternoon, everybody. Neil Carberry, I'm Chief Executive of the Recruitment and Employment Confederation, which is the UK's industry body and professional body for recruitment firms. Okay, fantastic. And, and Neil, I'm going to go to you first because I, I wonder whether your position as the uh, kind of uh, a gatekeeper for all of these other businesses, um, uh, particularly in the recruiting space, I wonder wonder whether you could give an opinion as to what the marketplace is doing um, in terms of, you know, full remote, full on premise. Are you messing around with some flavor of hybrid? What is the what is the agency market in the UK saying to you as, in terms of their own operations? I think it really depends on where you are. And it, I, I, you know, it goes to something Adam was saying earlier, right? If you're running on a business park on the edge of town somewhere where people park the general thing is people want to get back into the office let's get them back in um very different in city centers um in where people are still working at home and i think in the city centers there's more predilection towards doing the the hybrid option it'll be in i i think the the distribution is quite widespread between firms in the industry right now in terms of what they're doing i think a lot of people are waiting certainly in england for the the june 21st or 28th or whenever it turns out to be to try and make some decisions i think lots of companies are thinking about who are who are not fully operational now are thinking about september post summer as a big a big moment to, to step in um i think the other the other big thing is you'll all know that the the market for experienced consultants in the uk right now is red hot 
Um, and that is because there's a trust there that you can start someone at least partially remotely and, and they'll return. I think the office, and come back to something Neil Morrison was saying, the office is really important to early career workers and lots of agencies are very clear that they want to bring early career workers into the sector when they can put support frameworks around them. And that's actually my, my big point to land based on what Neil was saying, which is we've got to stop thinking of this as an individual employment relationship between us as agencies and individual employees. This is about working about what's best for the collective. And the point we just heard about take it, saying some tough stuff, you are going to have to say, uh, say to some people who are productive at home, um, mm -hmm. and can do their job at home, that part of their job, like part of my job at the REC, and I've said this to my team, is is to be in the office because I've got to be there to help the team who need that support framework around them. That's a very interesting point. Early career um, crisis. Um, I think if we just think a little bit about that, it becomes pretty obvious that uh, remote is most suitable for someone who is already highly skilled, already got some experience and, and able, confident uh, to be able to do the things. I remember back in back in when the day when I started, I think all of us are probably similar generation. I hope you don't mind me saying this. Um, we probably all entered the, the world of work, I don't know, 20 years ago or something else like that. Um, at that time, just crash your mind back, how much um, a job knowledge that you have learned through formal training versus observation of other people uh, and which lessons were most important. I can tell you straight away that 99.9% .9 was observing other people uh, and then figuring out that way. Now, how do we replicate that if we do go remote or even hybrid? Because as, as Alex mentioned, if it's hybrid and you've got choice, the young person coming in may not be chiming with somebody they want to spend time with. Like, how do they, how do, they do that? So that's actually a question I'm going to throw unions because in org design this must be one of the most exciting times ever because orgs are completely changing shape um how are you dealing with the early entry um development talent development early entry particularly is that something that you've thought about and and um uh, what do you think about it i i agree that we need to pay particular attention to um early careers and earlier career highs in terms of the development particularly because they don't have a network when they join. They don't know how things work. They don't know the ropes. They don't. And, you know, how easy is it for people to get a sense of where they're working if they're sat in the dining room table at home? Uh, there is something about the physicality of a space and being with people that you pick up differently than you would over a Zoom call or an MS Teams call. So there's that piece that you're talking about, which is the tacit knowledge you know the vibe that we get in our tacit workplace knowledge, yeah. and I think all of that is really critical in the development of young professionals in being able to have access to other people to observe what's going on in the office to you know have random chats and you know the serendipitous moments where you run into people you don't have those in in remote workspaces everything is very controlled in terms of when we actually meet and we take all of that chance you know, out of our working day because everything is so formally organised um, from a from a remote perspective. Um, but I I am pro remote, so I'm going to make my my stand in terms of I fully support that. But I think that it just depends on where you are in your career and what's best for that individual at that particular time. Is there an argument, and I'm, I'll, I'll actually make this argument, is there an argument to say young people should go in the office or people should leave it? Um, like we're talking about a, 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 an age stratification of this. I'll have a go at that for you, Hung. Is that a question um, to me, Hung? I'm, I'm throwing it out there to anybody. Uh, people come at me, you know what I mean? I'm saying go that on, if you're like just coming university out of university, worst thing in the world is you be a remote. You need to spend two, three years in office on campus. Um, and after that, you can graduate and you can work from home. What do you think of that? So I think you see, I think there is greater value in personal interactions when you've got tougher stuff to do. So we were, I was on a meeting this morning, we were talking about the conflict you want in a business is the conflict of task. The conflict you don't want is the conflict of relationship. So you need a certain amount of invest. You talked about trust earlier, invested trust to do really tough stuff. And that means actually, I think, senior staff are going to be in the office more and have to accept that the part of their responsibility to the collective is being in the 
in the office more. The other thing is, you know, we've all in our careers had something happen to us because we happen to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and you remove that serendipity from younger workers if they do not have access, not just to their manager. And I think we're obsessed with thinking about time with manager. It's actually time with the rest of the business to understand how things are done. So I go the other way. I'm I'm pro remote as well. But I do think that companies need to come up with a way that works for them and their business to offer the flexibility to staff to do to do lots of remote working. Because frankly, I think the way the labor market's going in the UK right now in terms of tightness of labor force, but globally, we're heading for a tighter labor force in lots of the developed markets. You're going to need that to compete for staff coming in. Then you have to you have to acknowledge that that's a collective collective agreement is a phrase that's uh, steeped in meaning coming from the trade union side i don't mean it like that but your staff you need to have a vision for how how what you do works for your business and works for your staff on average not for the individual each individuals you know what what we heard earlier whatever you do you're downed one way or the other yet yeah, some members of staff will be upset with what you do you've just got to have the courage to make the decision that works for the group. And that does mean, sorry, you, you, your middle class people don't get to spend time in their gardens on days like today working on the laptop. They need to be in the office on uh, on the days you need them. That's going to be really tough cheese for some people. Um, and what we can expect is we're going to expect people leaving for this. So I think there's going to be mm -hmm. There's going to be a, sh a kind of a, a redistribution, isn't there? Like there's some companies are going to come to the point where they're saying, you know what, we are going to go with this structure, with wherever it is on premise, hybrid in some way, um, remote in others. Um, and then it's going to be people that don't fit that will maybe gravitate to businesses that have a different configuration that suits them. So um, maybe this will all like wash out in the next 12, 12 months or so um, when companies stick to a a way of working and then if it doesn't work for the people who happen to be there they can go ahead and, and check out some other opportunities where there's, there's different ways of working i guess maybe maybe all of this will be solved without too much uh you know thinking it'll just uh, re resolve as a result of market forces god help us i i would agree with that i think you know some of the things that we've talked about earlier on you know they're so hard to predict because cause and effect systemically is hard to predict Right. We can see patterns over time, but that's what I'm saying. You've got to do it in order for you to see the results. So it's all good and well. We love to catastrophize. But until we actually, you know, start walking towards it, we're never going to see the end of it. So for me, I don't see the point in catastrophizing. I just see the point in going with whatever we've got and making the best of it, because that's, you know, in in VUCA times, that's what we've got to do. We've got to just experiment and see what happens rather than thinking about what could happen and what if, because there's going to be an inordinate amount of what ifs. Um, so, you know, there's, there's very little point in me talking about that. So for me, it's about what's going to be the best based on what we've got and the choices that we have with our capabilities and what's right for the organization. I'm an advocate for the organization because that's what we need to survive it's the organization that needs to survive as an od consultant my role is to ensure the survivability of the organization and with its people so there's a real and there's a real balance that needs to be had and I, I agree i think it is about the collective piece but i also believe that what alex was talking about i think some of that breeds anxiety in organizations and i notice a shift in the anxiety has moved from the employee to the ceo and the leadership so there's been a real swing right. and change in how organizations are feeling and its people. There's a big tension there. And Adam, you mentioned um, uh, 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 there's loads of acronyms, but I like this one, fear of returning to the office. Um, does anybody else have this fear? Um, a sense of anxiety about going back um, uh, because we have spent a long time away. You know, it has been a long time away. 12, 18 months is long enough for us to develop a habit or develop a, a thinking or a process on it. Um, folks, we're running really short on time, so really sorry about this, but um, I want to, again, leave a final word to uh, you two in terms of, you know, what your advice would be to employees. 
um, uh, in terms of how would you communicate to employees of you know the need to maybe think about the organization um, as opposed to uh, you know locating the entire conversation in, in of themselves, knowing for well that that's going to come with uh, resistance. Oh, Adam's left us. That's fine. Well, go ahead. I think the point we've just heard actually is really powerful, which is you, your chief executive is going to be trying to work out what the plan is. And there is no 100 percent perfect plan. What have I said to the REC staff? We're going to go for hybrid in September. I'm going to get 50 percent of it wrong. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to learn as we go. And so the most important thing for employees now is to be talking to uh, your employer about what works for you. And work and understanding what they will need and and trying to find a way to link those together. Now, if where you end up doesn't work for you, then there's always a mechanism for that. The labor market will churn, people will choose different roles and opportunities. But understanding that businesses are going to be doing this test operate over the next year, if you've been privileged enough to be working at home throughout this, the most important thing is engage in voice tell people in the business about what would work for you and be really reasonable about what you hear from other uh, other people not just the business your own colleagues will feel differently so there's no such thing as the staff think this and you staff people need to appreciate that how are your thoughts on this Nims? how do we create the circumstances where honest conversations can happen um where you know not everyone can get the optimal thing for every, uh, all the time um how do we create the circumstances where we can have that conversation I, you know, I think there are lots of opportunities and interventions that we can use. So things like anonymous surveys, focus groups, working groups, you know, those conversations are not easy to have, but I think they are happening in the conversations and they need to happen right from the top. So, you know, you know, I'm really touched by what Alex said about her anxiety and how she feels. And these are the conversations that CEOs and business leaders need to be having with their people to see that you know this is what it's what's happening for me at an individual level as a leader of this organization and that vulnerability is likely to invite those open conversations about actually i haven't thought about it like that because we only think about things from our own perspectives when we start thinking about what's being taken away we don't really see it from you know someone else's frame of reference so i think the openness and the vulnerability from senior leaders is important about what they see the issues are Talking about emotions in the workplace really helps. You know, there's lots of talk about fear and anxiety. Um, we often talk about from an employee level, but we should start talking about it from a leader level. And I, you know, completely agree with what's been said about it's about finding a balance between the leaders, the management, the employees, and business needs. You're going to have to strike some sort of a balance. And it's hard to do that. So there are tough messages which are need to, going to be need to have and choices that need to be made. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Let's leave that as the final question. What do you think is how uh, is, is going to be the settled state? And I know every business will have slightly different flavors, but the majority of businesses, how do you actually see them sort of functioning? I'm going to present five options to you, okay? Um, uh, so try and keep these in your mind, but I want you two to, 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 to kind of uh, give me a thought on this. Firstly, a uh, full on-premise. So in other words, we are bouncing back this is the goldman sachs position um uh, you know what we've had your 18 months back to the office that's it there's option one um opposite end of that full remote it, it, this is like the GitLab option it says you know what forget the office we're going to sell the office no office uh, everyone is uh, sort of working completely distributed uh, and then we've got all kinds of flavors of hybrid and i'm going to throw a couple of options there uh, in, in between we have the hybrid where anybody can choose um anytime so in other words, office is available, but you as an employee get the choice when you want to turn up, when you want to use it, when you want to work remote. I'm calling that hybrid max. But the office facility is there. Um, there is a, a second, a third or fourth option is what Alex is doing fixed time in office so in other words there is additional days where you can spend remotely um so you get two remote days you get two weekend days then a holiday and then you get three days in the office that's your five days but the three it's a three to two type of model uh, but we are sticking to those days in other words you can't slide those around it's fixed into the business um and the final option which again i'm just imagining what these options are right i'm just like throwing them out at you um 
What about the uh, idea of um, employees get a single choice to make at, the, uh, at one go, a fixed choice? So in other words, are you remote or are you in office? You choose, sir. Um, and then, you know, whatever you choose is like, we're going to basically design your job career plan based on the choice you make. So if you're saying you're in office, great. This is how we're going to play it. If you're going to say you're remote, that's also great. This is how we're going to play it. Um, what are your thoughts on those five options, if you can keep them in your minds at one time? Uh, so I have a view that it's going to be probably a fixed days, but my condition is that it will be fixed based on what is happening in your team. So I don't think it's going to be a full on business decision. I think it's going to be a team based piece. And if you're like me working as a consultant internally, then it's going to be a team based plus holding some sort of piece around your, your client piece. So, for example, if my working days in the office is going to be Tuesday and I've got a client meeting on a Monday, OK, I'm going to make some compromise. So I think there's going to be some flex around that. Right. So I love it because it's even more complicated because it gets more complicated, doesn't it? So even within the category of fixed hybrid, it's going to be fixed yep. hybrid per business unit or per team rather than overall, yeah. we're, you know, 10,000 person business. We're going to do it this way. No, it may just be flexing and slanting. I like that. OK, what are your thoughts, Neil? What do you think is going to happen? Um, look, I'm right there, and I, I don't think it, I don't think that's more complicated. It's more complicated if you're trying to command and control it from the centre. Teams are capable of scheduling. Yeah, let's trust them to schedule. I I think the model will be that companies will make a decision that says our core contract is I don't know three days in the office, two days at home every week on average. We expect you to be flexible because there's days you're going to have to come in and do a pitch, and it might be your at home day if you're you're going to be here on that day, and we can swap it swap it round. Uh, you know, if there's a week where you want to do three days at home rather than two, you can have a chat with your manager. Um, mm. And then from that, that will just be the base, like five days in the office has been for people to request flexible working beyond that, whether they want to come in more or come in less. You know, we're not going to torpedo everyone's flexible working that pre-existed. So I, I think it is firms making a decision about the base number they want people in and the other thing is of course that's the thing that the fd will need because your fd is really only worried about your rent and they are not going to pay for people to have two fully serviced offices they will pay for an office that meets the need based on how often you're telling people to come in so 60 percent of the space i don't think people will cut as much as that but i think floor plate, plates will come down and that of course will create some of the capital that hopefully firms will invest in the in the support that's needed to make uh, to make it work yeah very very good so i i, I love that i think that's basically I'm, I'm more comfortable now than i was at the beginning of the show uh, from the contribution of all of you in the panel um future i think what we can say is the future will certainly be more flexible than the before times right it's definitely the nine to five commute every day into the office i think that's done there's no way um uh, i can't imagine many companies getting away with it uh, but the the free-for-all option in the sense that you know employees get choice whenever they want i think that's not going to be sustainable for too many companies um it's going to be some sort of fixed hybrid in other words three to two maybe that's the new thing we've got to think about three days in office two days off office but you're still working in some way but you agree at team level, business level, whatever level you decide is appropriate. And generally, I think life and work will be better once we get there. Um, we've just got to, you know, we're in that period where we're teasing it out and we can understand this tension uh, uh, on both sides. Anyway, um, that's about it. Thank you very much, Neil and Nims. Uh, really great having you two on the show. Sorry we didn't give you enough time as you deserve. Um, I hope that's okay, but we're running short on time as it is. Uh, let's bring you back some other time. Neil, great to see you. You have a very good day, sir. Um, and Nims, great to see you as well. I'll hopefully get you both back at some other point. I do want to talk about employee activism and CEO activism. And this kind of conflict we're starting to see emerge quite publicly. We saw BrewDog today, last couple of days, for instance, both employees and the CEO stepping in, having conversations, not for the first time this year. And probably this will be a, a, a going concern as we go forward. Now, how do we deal with that? That seems like a business risk to me um, uh, when, you know, you're in, you're in public conflict with your employees. That's a bad thing. So we'll definitely talk about that at some other point. Okay, okay. Neil, have a good day. Uh, Nims, have a good day. Thanks. Bye.
Cool. What an exciting show, folks. I thought that was excellent. I really uh, wish we had more time because it's definitely something that we want to discuss further. But um, I'm uh, feeling good about where we're at in terms of at least the debate. I hope you understand the purpose of us having this conversation wasn't to push any agenda other than to say we have to talk about it in a bit more depth. Uh, rather than just wander forward without the discussion. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, please follow the channel on Crowdcast. We do this show every Friday. Um, we're back next week. We're going to be talking about how to hire more women into tech. Um, and we've got some amazing guests, community builders, uh, CTOs, uh, and tech hirers, all kinds of people going to help us think about that particular challenge. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, um, do join us for that. Um, final thank you for our sponsors, E6 Executive Search Information Exchange. Um, they are a, the networking group for senior level exec hirers. Uh, so if you're recruited that's hiring for C-level, check out E6. They've actually got an event happening, I think, next week, um, which um, is open to members to uh, participate in. Um, so it might be a useful opportunity for you to check out if you're not sure about uh, whether this is a network for you. Anyway, that's about it, folks. I hope you're well. I should be back in the UK next time. So I will see you in a decent time uh, in a week's time.